try to find a space somewhere. <coughs> okay, very good. I've got a subject. This, please, maybe for the next month or two, no more um, emails. Please, can you talk about this? Please, can you talk about that? Because I've got a whole heap of them now of uh, subjects people wanted me to talk about. But the one I chose for this week is such a common problem and it's a very beautiful answer to the problem. Is that someone was saying that you know, they really give a lot in life, they really try and help other people, but all they get back in return is shit from them. They never seem to get <laughs> never seem to get any appreciation, they're actually quite the opposite. And so actually Bob <laughs> please tell us you know, how to change things so we don't feel that so um, so reluctant to keep on giving and serving and helping because we don't seem to get any reward, in fact quite the opposite. And so you know, should we really help other people? Where's about our kindness and generosity? Does it really work? Because it seems to me it doesn't work. Should I just be selfish like everybody else? Help! And <laughs> It also, there was a, an email which we got and I just showed it to a few of the other people. There was a lady over in the US, maybe she's listening this evening, if she is, thank you for sending me this email, it really made me laugh. Because a couple of weeks ago I mentioned about being kind by learning how to listen to people rather than listen to people with kindness, rather than listen to people with fault finding. I mentioned the story of the, the monk whose brother snored and uh, he managed to listen to that snoring and turn it around to like, perceive it to be beautiful music and then just went totally to sleep. And so this woman actually was uh, complaining, saying that you know, she had a, a person who, you know, in one of these compartmental offices where everyone has their own little cu cubicle, the person in the next cubicle to her was really overweight and would always be breathing loudly and always be very negative and drive her crazy. And the only fun she ever gets in the office is being nasty to him. And I'm telling her, please, no, you must be kind to him. He said, that's taking the only pleasure I have at work. <laughs> Some people like that, they like being mean and nasty to other people. But surely we can have some compassion in this life, some kindness, some giving, some openness and without feeling that it's going to be unpleasant for us or that we're going to get taken advantage of or whatever. And the key story, which I'm going to say at the beginning and I'm going to work on this story throughout the talk, is a story I did hear many years ago. I tried actually to put it in my book, Good, Bad, Who Knows. It got into the, the edition which is in Singapore, but it was uh, deleted from the American version because apparently the story is really already well known over in the United States, at least by the uh, person who was editing my book. And it was you know, the story of the tree and the child. It's one of my favorite stories because not only is it a beautiful story to tell, it has this wonderful message and it's a very inspiring message too. So here's a little story of the tree and the child. There was this huge tree, mature, big, full of green leaves, in a forest close by to where a child lived. And the child would spend many days on the weekend and holidays climbing up that tree, because it had these low branches, you can climb up very easily, sitting in the tree, sort of playing games in the tree. And because it went up into that tree so often, the tree actually <laughs> I'm always a poser. <laughs> Thank you. The tree. <laughs> you forget it. You also have fun in life. Are the nuns as well? You wouldn't put some me. Oh, I'm just fed up now. <laughs> so the tree. You know, I was just many times I've taught retreats, and a couple of times on the retreat there've been supermodels. And I, it's true, I was teaching this retreat over in Kuala Lumpur and they told me this very famous Malaysian supermodel was on my retreat. And you know, you know, she looked really nice apparently, but she got very fed up at the end of the retreat. And she complained at the end of the retreat. Because at the end of the retreat, that no one wanted to take a photograph of her. They only wanted to take photographs of me. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know why she got upset at that. <laughs> That's a true story. They told me she was really pissed off. <laughs> and I can't understand why people want to take photographs of me anyway, but never mind. There we go. Anyway, back to the tree. There, so was <laughs> there was this tree. The kid used to love climbing it. And one day the little child thought, oh, you know, it'd be nice if I can do something more in this tree. And you know, this tree, you know, the trees are beings. You, know, you can't just say that you know, they haven't got any consciousness. And the tree could communicate with this little kid and say, why didn't you take some of my branches and build a little tree house? And the kid got this idea and built this really nice little tree house up in the tree. And even though it meant breaking off twigs, the tree was actually quite happy that you know, its friend, this little kid, could make a wonderful tree house you know, in the top of the tree or the middle of the tree. It could spend even more time in the tree. Because the, the tree actually loved this little kid. And so the kid would play, spend a lot of time in the little tree house. And after a while, you know, the, tree, the kid had to go to school and he spent less and less time in the tree. And the tree house started to fall apart. And the tree was actually quite sad. And then one day the kid came back again, but now he was a teenager. And the tree said, oh, thank you, you're coming back again. Look, even the old tree house has you know, fallen apart. There's many other branches. You can make another tree house, a bigger one now. You've grown up. And the kid said to the tree, the tree could understand the kid. He said, no, I don't need a tree house anymore. I'm too big for that now. You know, I, I'm going to university soon and I can't really afford it. I don't know what to do. And the tree said, look, there's lots and lots of fruit coming soon. Now, because I'm coming to that point where I'm going to make lots of fruit, I'm going to make lots for you, so please take the fruit and go and sell it. And with the money you make from the fruit, you can actually go and, and, and uh, pay your university fees. So the tree put forth extra effort that year and got so much fruit, and the kid collected all of it, picked every last fruit, and went to sell it. And that was how he managed to get through that first year of university. And every year afterwards, the tree got more fruit every year, really putting more effort, and that's the way the kid got through university. And that really tied out the tree. And after the fourth year, the kid came back again, and the tree said, do you want some more fruit? He said, I'm big trouble now. He said, I'm going to get married. And I don't know how on earth I'm going to pay for all of this. And the tree said, look, you know, we're friends. I've known you since you were small. I'm going to get double fruit this year. You just come back in a few weeks and just see. And this poor tree put every bit of energy and effort and life it had to get so much fruit. And it almost killed it to produce so much fruit. But the kid came along and there was so much fruit, collected it all, sold it all and had enough m money to actually to get married. And afterwards the, the, the poor tree was actually badly injured, wounded. It lost all its energy just working so hard to make more fruit than it really should have done. But nevertheless, the tree was happy. It helped its friend. But as for the kid, it didn't come back again for three or three years. And when it did come back, he said, I need something more now. I'm going to have a baby soon. I need a house. And the tree said, I can't produce any more fruit. I was damaged producing that double fruit last time. But, said the tree, I've got these very big branches. Take those branches and build yourself a house. And the kid thought, but it will really damage you. He said, no, no, I really would want you to have these branches. Come tomorrow with a saw. Take this one and this one. These are very big branches, lots of very strong wood. You can build a wonderful house. So the kid came the next day and saw most of the big branches off the tree. Without those branches, couldn't have any twigs, couldn't have any leaves, couldn't have any fruit. That almost killed that tree. But the tree was very happy, managed to supply this beautiful wood so the friend could build a house for their family. 
Never saw the kid for another four or five years and the tree was half dead anyway. But the kid came back again, now about 30, and said, Tree, I hate to say this, but I need something more from you. I'm starting a business now, carpentry business, making furniture. Can I please take your trunk? And the tree said, that's all I've got left. But I'll be so happy to give it to you. Because I really care for you and I want you to do well in life. You've got a kid, you've got a family, you do need something to sort of feed your kids and look after your family and buy things for them and send them to good school. He said, come and take my trunk. It's very good, it's really strong inside. So the next day, the kid saw the trunk of the tree took it away and started his business. And the tree never saw him for about 30, 40 years. Now just because you take the, the trunk down doesn't mean the tree dies. You know, we had a Bodhi tree of Bodhi Jnana, and we had a big fire in 1991. And we thought the tree had died. For three years, nothing was happening. And I really thought it had gone. And after three years, being dormant, he started to put forth shoots. You know, it was the roots underground were you know, very obviously damaged by the huge bushfire, but was still alive, still had a bit of energy left, and built up that energy, waiting for three years before he could put forth shoots. And the tree's still there now, many years later. So many years later, the old child came again. He was an old man now. And he said, I just come back here for nostalgia. I remember all those wonderful days I had when I was a young kid, climbing up you. I remember all those wonderful things which you helped me with. You know, you gave me your twigs to make a nice little tree house. I had so much fun making the tree house and living in you. I remember all the fruit you gave me to go to university. The f incredible amount of fruit you gave me, which almost killed you so I could get married. And the, and the branches, which I made my house out of, and even the trunk, which made me have a business which was quite successful. He said, but now I haven't come to ask you for anything. The tree said, pretty good job because there's nothing else to give. <laughs> <laughs> but i just come to say thank you. I've had a wonderful life, thanks to you. And the old tree said, actually I have still got something to give you. You're very old now and you need to rest. Lay down your head on my roots, and I can just support you just for a few more times. So the old, the kid, now an old man, laid his head on the roots of this tree, which had helped him all his life, and fell into a nice quiet sleep, and the tree was so happy. That is a simile. The tree stands for your parents, your mum and dad, who would give everything for you. Just like the tree gave little twigs so the kid could build a little tree house. How many of you have had little children and they climb all over you, pulling your <laughs> put, putting their, <laughs> their feet in your mouth? <laughs> or whatever it is, and you love it. You're just so happy to have your kids just play with you. And then later on, when they go to university, you just work so hard, saving money, getting loans from the bank, which you can't really afford, just to make sure they get a good education. When they get married, last Sunday I performed two marriage services, and you see the parents are so proud. They give anything just to see their daughter, their son, just so happy. And that tree would give just twice as much fruit as it could possibly afford, because just loved seeing the children happy. And then of course, building a house, where does your deposit come from for many of you, your mum and dad? <laughs> Even though it says superannuation, they cash it in for you, help you with your business all your life. And in the end, all they really want is for you to lay down your head on their lap, because they will love you forever. Doesn't matter what you ask for, even if it kills them, they give it to you. That tree 
are your parents and you are that little boy you are that student you are that boy about to get married wanting a house starting a job just wanting a rest they're just so happy just to see you that is my wonderful simile of giving what did the tree get out of that it just get cut down and killed but did the ki the tree ever want anything else just to be able to give that is my answer when people say oh i don't get anything back in return except shit when i give exactly that is why we give <laughs> that is a joy of giving that is a wonderful thing about sacrificing giving to people you love you care for and that can be anyone you don't expect anything back in return in fact if you do get something back in return it's not giving it's business <laughs> and that's one of the things which when i found out this you know about because you know we a big organization now about uh, some of your donations you know from the nuns monastery monks monastery this place some of your donations you ask for tax deductible receipts <laughs> but i've got to pay tax such a bomb yes i know but why are you giving is it really to get something back in return have you ever noticed whether it's a nuns monastery the monks monastery a john grove retreat center or this place there's never any notices on the wall about who donated how much who gave the money for this hall we're staying in now who donated so much because for me that's not giving that is buying advertising rights for your ego Ima imagine it said ajan brahm hall this hall was donated by ajan brahm that's ego that's advertising that's not giving that's not this beautiful act i'm just doing this because it needs to be done and i get so much joy what this is i'm just working out a waysack ceremony which is coming up in a couple of weeks time that's the 32nd waysack i've done in perth 31 years i've been serving here and what have i got out of it <laughs> i'm i'm as poor as when i came here absolutely nothing gray hairs old broken teeth fat belly that's what i've got out of this <laughs> physically you've got nothing out of this but that's not the point you've had so much joy and happiness serving over all these years that is why you do this and that's what i'm going to do this until i'm dead there's no retirement for a monk or a nun by the way <laughs> <laughs> the only way out of here you know is in the box <laughs> and that's wonderful you don't want it to be anything different so when you learn what real giving is what serving is it's just serving just why because that's what it is to be a human being to serve and give and i know just at the very end of your days it's like that tree when it looks back on how it's used its life it's so content and happy that its twigs and its fruit and its branches and been lit and its wood have been used for a really good purpose which is one of the reasons why you look back on your life when you're old and say what have you done with your life I don't mean doing something great like so Fred Hollows and starting this eye foundation over in sort of uh, you know poor countries. I don't mean like being a Nelson Mandela and just you know being a great politician and statesman who saved you know the so many thousands of people in South Africa. I'm talking about just the ordinary small things which you have done in your life. The things which will never be known by anybody except the people who you've touched, you've helped, you've you served you've been kind to that is your legacy that's the reason why you're here it's not to be some big shot who's famous but to be a beautiful kind person who served and helped so many a tree which has given all its leaves and twigs fruit and wood for the sake of the happiness and well-being of people you love and care for that's what you're here for 
which is one of the reasons why that when you do have children there's something fantastic about that it does really teach you incredible lessons about what life is really all about just to give and to serve and it is so true that you know when you go and see your parents because it's Mother's Day when, when is Mother's Day? This, this Sunday is it? Oh Sunday, well, okay it's a warning for you <laughs> And why do you go and look after your mum? It's just because what does your mum do to you? You know, for most mums, of course there's a few mums who've got some problems, but most mums, <laughs> and they're very rare, come on, be fair enough. Most mums are just, are just so happy to see you. I was just so impressed, you know, with like the idea of a mother, because sometimes you see these mothers going to visit their sons in jail. And you know, they, when they see their mothers in jail, they say, my son is not an ordinary burglar, he's one of the best in Perth. <laughs> <laughs> they are proud of their, their kids. <laughs> I learnt this, I learnt this when I first went to visit my mother in London. I don't know if I, I told this story somewhere recently, but I can't forget where. When I went to visit my mother in London, I was 1980, would well, be 1981, I think, because I've been seven years in Thailand. Now, of course, 1981, that's 30 and a bit years ago, there weren't that many monks in the streets of London at that time. So when I went to visit my mother, I was thought she'd be embarrassed seeing me. You know, because be, be honest, you're wearing this brown robe, you do look like a girl, <laughs> and why are you dressed like this? You know, and maybe, okay, Australia is a bit loose, but you know, England. <laughs> <laughs> so, now English custom, because my mother works, you know, five days a week, it comes to Saturdays, that shopping days. So she went to, not shopping malls, before shopping malls, high streets. So the main street in the suburbs with shops on either side of the main road. And that's where she does her shopping every Saturday. And so I went all that way to, you know, to spend time with my mother. So she was out shopping. I'll help you. I'll carry something or whatever. And she said, yeah, yeah, come along. And so I was walking with my mother along this main road, hundreds, thousands of people on a Saturday morning. Now I thought that she would actually you know, walk you know, three or four steps ahead of me or behind me, you know, just so I'm not really with this weird guy. <laughs> and the first thing I was impressed with is no, right beside me, obviously that you know, we were together. And the next thing which I was surprised with, because if any of you know these uh, high streets in London, they're very narrow streets. You know, they're built for horses, not for cars. Very narrow streets and to protect the pedestrians from the traffic they always have railings on the side of the road and those railings serve another purpose not just protecting the pedestrians from the traffic that's also where you leave the babies in their prams and tie the dogs before you go into the shop and that's where I thought my mother would leave me <laughs> with the babies and the dogs Uh, but I was really surprised. She said, no, come inside the shop. And she was not at all embarrassed, not even a smidgen of embarrassment. But as soon as I walked in, hey, this is my son, the monk. <laughs> Announcing to everybody, even other customers she didn't even know. <laughs> and that's where I found out just the pride of a mother for her son. Doesn't matter just who you are or how you look. Your mother's love for you is incredible. They're proud of you, no matter who you are, what you do. They, to you, they may always be criticizing you. You're not good enough, you're not working hard enough, do this, do that, blah, 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 blah. But you know, to others, they're so proud of you. Which brings me on to an old joke, but it's one of my favorite ones, about the pride of mothers. There was four mothers having a cup of coffee you know, in Cottesloe somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the mothers said, this round of coffee is on me because I'm celebrating. Today, she said, 
Today, this morning, my son became a Catholic priest. He said, I'm so proud of him because he's a bunch of Catholics, because it doesn't work if it's not Catholic. So it's nothing against Catholics. <laughs> it doesn't work otherwise. <laughs> and he said, now everybody in his church you know, bows and calls him father. I'm so, so proud of my son. And then the next lady, you know, she's another Catholic, she sniffs and says, that's nothing. He's only a priest. My son became a priest about 10 years ago. Now he is a bishop. He's a bishop. When he, in his church, people go on one knee, they kiss his ring and they call him, your grace, your grace. I'm so proud of him. And the third lady, she sips her coffee and says, only a bishop. My son was a bishop five years ago. He is now a cardinal. When he comes into the church, everybody gets down on both knees and they call him, your eminence, your eminence. I'm so proud of my son. He's now a cardinal. And then they all look at the fourth, fourth lady. <laughs> and the fourth lady finishes her coffee and she said, that's nothing, that's nothing at all. My son, my son never joined any church. My son, my son joined the Fremantle Dockers. <laughs> he is six foot four inches tall. He's drop dead gorgeous. When he comes into a room, all the girls go right on the floor and say, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of him. Okay, for those listening overseas, Fremantle Dockers is one of the footy teams over here. Please uh, excuse me if you're Eagle supporters, but I try and balance it every time. <laughs> but mother's always really proud, and that's very nice to see that. And this is actually the beautiful thing. They give, give, give. What does a mother ask for in return from the child? You don't expect anything back in return. Just the opportunity to give is all you really want, all you really love to do. And that is you know, not just a girl, that's, fathers do that too. You know, fathers work really hard and they just want to sort of just look after their kids. And a lot of times the fathers just, behind the scenes, they just want to give, give, give to their kids. And once their kids are happy, they are happy. And if the kid wants something, the fathers will, oh, okay, here we go. And we'll always help you. Now that type of father, that type of mother, or let's say that type of friend, because there are friends like that as well. There are friends, hopefully you've got people like that, who you can turn to when you're in need. They say, yeah, please, take it. Because I'll get so much more happiness knowing I've helped you, knowing I've served, knowing I've done something for you. That's all I want. That's why we never ask for any donations over here. It's our just joy to give to you guys. I don't care, you know, just uh, if you put a donation in there or not. No one sort of takes CCTV cameras and this one that's blacklisted because they never put anything in there ever since they come here and they've been here for 30 years. <laughs> that's not what we do here. It's just you know, the joy of giving. That's what it means to be a human being, to give and serve others. And you get so much joy back in return. But if you expect something back in return, and even if you expect you know, people to at least not give you shit back in return, <laughs> it means you haven't understood what being a human being is. There are some people that sometimes they don't really understand what you're doing and who you are. Sometimes some people are just in a very, very bad state. I remember this, <laughs> just it comes to mind, one of these artists who used to come to our Armadale group so many years ago, he was an art teacher at Claremont, I think it was. And he said one of his colleagues was just a bad person. And, you know, this art teacher was you know, quite a spiritual guy. And, he, and you know, he smiled at this colleague one day and the colleague just punched him in the nose and flattened him <laughs> for smiling. And <laughs> he met the guy years later. You know, he had to leave the school after that. Met him years later and 
this friend came up and said, oh, we were such good friends in those days. <laughs> and the teacher said, what? You know, you flattened me. He said, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. But his perception of the relationship was totally different than the other person's relationship. The guy who hit the art teacher was going through some very, very difficult time, but recognized the art teacher was actually trying to be kind to him. And even though he couldn't express that he'd recognize this, and even just it looked like he just you know, was angry at this art teacher, it is still the kindness had gone in there somewhere. And it stayed with him for all those years. And so when they met again, you know, the person who punched the art teacher still regarded this art teacher as one of his good friends. It's interesting. Because sometimes that we give, 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 and we think we're getting nowhere. We think all we're getting back is being punched, all we're getting back is being criticized, all we're get, getting back is just more criticism, more pain, more difficulty. But the actual fact is that you are actually making a big difference to the person. Well, look about you. You know, when people are kind to you, doesn't that sort of add to the the wealth of your day, doesn't it actually uplift you slightly? It may not uplift you enough to speak kind things back to the person who helps you, but it still, it uplifts you. It gives you a boost. Which is knowing what it's like to receive kindness, what it's like to receive help, what it's like to receive service. What is it like when someone you know, spends time looking after you? When you realize its value, then you understand why you should help and serve and be kind to other people. It's valuable, it's a beautiful thing in life, it's the currency of life. Not the dollars and cents, that's not the currency of life. You know, we should really be measuring our economy by the amount of kindness which goes into our daily lives. You know, the amount of, of generosity, the amount of service, the amount of smiles, the amount of just lo looking after one another, sharing a joke together, that is much more important than you know, dollars and cents. Because that is really just what life is all about, that's what gives it meaning. Just like the tree, understood that, and would give everything, and died a very, very happy, fulfilled tree had nothing left in, in the way of resources, but had so many beautiful memories of kindness and joy and love. Which is one of the reasons why, as far as I'm concerned, that is the meaning of life, not just the money business. Now, what was it just recently, in just New Year's Day, our body society got robbed. You know, somebody came in here while we were doing our New Year's Day ceremony, and uh, empty the donation box. Oh, isn't that nice? I hope they really enjoyed all the, the money they got and had a very good time with it. <laughs> you know, I told people at the time they're getting upset and angry. Don't get upset and angry. You know, it's money. That's not what we're here for. And it reminded me of my other, one of my other lovely stories, which is in Good, Bad, Who Knows, and about the, the old monk the abbot who woke up early in the morning because he heard a noise in the shrine room. And first of all, he thought it was the monks got up early to do some chanting. But he realized, no, not in this temple. <laughs> They'd still be sleeping. So he got up and realized the noise was a burglar. A burglar had come in to the meditation hall and was opening the donation box with a knife. And so what did the monk do? He reached into his pockets and the burglar said, Stop it! If you do anything, I'll knife you. And the monk just, from his pockets, picked up the keys. If you want to open the box, here are the keys. Is this a trick? <laughs> no, said the monk. Those are, what, why do people give donations? It's to help people. You're obviously very poor. Just take what you need. And so the, the thief took the keys, started opening the box, but still looking at the monk and pointing the knife at him in case it was a trick. And the monk saw this burglar and said to him, because he saw the burglar look very thin, when was the last time you had anything to eat?
None of your business, said the burglar. That's why I like telling this story, because I can shout. <laughs> There's many things I'm not allowed to do as a monk, but when I tell stories, <laughs> I'm allowed to shout. <laughs> Above the donation box in the cupboard, said the monk, there's some food left over from this morning. Help yourself. This is a trick! No, help yourself! So the thief emptied the donation box, put all the money in his pockets, and then emptied the cupboard, and put all the food in his pockets too. And then, having filled up all his pockets with the money and the food, he pointed the knife at the monk and said, Don't call the police! Why should I, said the monk, you haven't stolen anything, I've given you this, go away in peace. And the thief ran away. And the following morning, when the committee found everything had been robbed, the monk said exactly what had happened. You know the committee was so proud of that monk? Would you be proud? Maybe the treasurer and the president may not be because they've got a job to do. <laughs> Yeah, they would be, I know them. But isn't that a nice thing to do? Isn't that inspiring? That's the sort of thing which religious people should do. We're not in this for the money, we're in this for the kindness. So they, you know, they were very, very inspired by this monk. And anyway, next couple of days, the monk was looking at the newspaper and found that robber had been arrested. He was robbing another house where they weren't so kind and was sent to jail for ten years. Ten years and a few days later, the abbot's still there, because monks can't, just, they can't retire. They, you work us till we're dead. <laughs> <laughs> so the old abbot was still there, you know, ten years older. He heard a sound in the shrine room. He went to investigate, middle of the night, and guess who was there? The robber, released from jail. As soon as he released from jail, come back to the temple, had a big knife, opened the donation box again. And the thief said to the monk, do you remember me? And the monk said, oh yeah, I remember you, here's the key. <laughs> <laughs> and at that, the robber put down the knife, smiled and said, I don't want that key. And said, for the last ten years, every day, I've been thinking about you. You're the only person in my whole life who's ever shown me some kindness. I was robbing your monastery and all you were thinking about is how thin I was and how I needed some food. I've never met anyone like you before. And as I was spending all those long years in myself, I decided I need to come back again and steal again. But I realized last time I tried to steal the wrong thing. Now I've come back to steal the secret of your compassion and kindness. Please teach me how to be kind when someone is robbing you. <laughs> now that is a story which inspired me. People ask me, is it a real story? I don't know, who cares? <laughs> It's beautiful. It should be a real story. <laughs> what did the monk get out of that? Nothing. Lost all the donations, lost the food, woken up in the middle of the night. But what he got is a person who understood what kindness was, what giving is, what selflessness is, what beauty is. Those are the things which make this life worthwhile, which make life beautiful. So can you do that? Can you be like a tree who gives everything? You do that to your children. I'm sure many of you have done that already. You've done that to maybe your partner and you think they don't appreciate that. That doesn't matter. I don't care whether you appreciate it or not. I'm just giving anyway. Where well, are you going to say thank you? I don't care. I'm just going to do it because it's a nice, kind, beautiful thing to do. Fortunately, that's something which is very common in monasteries. In monastery where I live, I've been there for such a long time, you've got the ethos, it 
it's not what you're getting out of these things, it's what you're giving, that's what we, we enjoy. So many monks, you're only supposed to work four mornings a week, they work on the afternoons as well, they don't have to. Why do you do that? Because I just want to serve, I get so much joy out of giving things. If ever you go to Dharmasara monastery where the nuns are, Bodhinyana monastery, go there for lunch one day. You can bring a plate, an empty plate, because we've got too much food. Take some away with you. You know sometimes that people can't understand that, they think, you're a monk, why can't you grow a garden and grow your own food? Why can't you at least cook your own? Why are you monks, at least why don't you wash your own dishes? We don't. You know, people come to Bodhinyana Monastery every day, they get up really early and they cook delicious food. Sometimes, these, remember in the early days the Thai women would make this delicious food for me and their husbands would complain. They said, she never cooks anything like that for me. <laughs> but for the monks and nuns, special food. And they drive it all the way to Dhammasar, 45 minutes from here, or Bodhinyana, an hour from here. And they just present it. And then they, they uh, get a blessing, that's all they ever get. And then they have to wash up afterwards and they even give a donation for the, for, the, for the opportunity, the privilege of actually serving the monks and the nuns. They actually pay us for that service. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> Would people do that for you? Come to your house, and give you excellent food, you know, serve you, wash up for you and give you a donation. Thank you for letting us use your place to... <laughs> Why do they do this for? And every time I've done, because I, I know the answer in it, I've asked them, because I do this in, in, in public so other people can get it. And what do you do this for? We love this. It's such a beautiful thing to serve, to give, to help, to share. It's a beautiful thing to do. What do you get out of this? Happiness, that's all. It's a beautiful thing of happiness, which people search for in all sorts of different ways, not realizing that happiness is so easy to find. Just, you know, being kind to someone in St. George's Terrace. Just, you know, letting them sort of take your seat on the, the bus or le just letting somebody come in. Just, you know, on the, uh, in front of you, in the traffic. Simple, easy things create so much joy and happiness in the world. Uh, <laughs> I'm going travelling again tomorrow, but the last time I went travelling I was going through Changi Airport and saw this this Western woman, she was trying to get some sleep on one of the benches and she was moving all, all over the place because, you know, she'd obviously done an overnight flight and it was the middle of the day and so busy she couldn't get any sleep. And, and I carry all these, um, what's it called, eye shades because I get these eye shades, I use them for meditation retreats so people can actually meditate and not see things. And I had one in my pocket and so I, I, it's, I never had seen this girl before in my life and I said, you know, you're having a hard time sleeping, try one of these. And I just remember the look on her face, it was astounded. What? Someone's being kind to me, I don't even know them. And I gave to her, said, yeah, have a nice sleep, and walked away. And I know that just, I made that woman's, certainly a day, maybe a week, a month. Simple thing like that, just means so much in this world. And I was just so happy she gave me the opportunity to do something like that. That type of kindness, that type of goodness. I don't care if she calls me a bad word, you idiot monk, what are you doing that for? I don't care about that. I don't want anything back. I just want the opportunity to do and to serve and to give and to help. That's why just, you know, going off tomorrow, where am I going tomorrow? I'm going to Melbourne tomorrow morning to help out the Buddhist Society of Victoria, another temple. I've got enough temples to look after, but they give me all these other ones to look after as well. Do I mind? No. Another opportunity to serve and give. And you think, well that's going to tire you out. That's going to exhaust you. For those of you who've known me a long time, and now I do actually work really hard, and they say, you should start stopping Ajahn Brahm, you're going to kill yourself. All this travelling, all this hard work, you know, you're getting old, come on Ajahn Brahm. And there was, I went a year ago to Thailand and saw this old monk, and a monk called Ajahn Ganha, 
Many of you may know him from opening the door of the heart. He's the one who patted the king cobra. And the king cobra came to see him in the jungle, and head up, and a hood out, right in front of him. And what does this monk do? Pat the cobra on the head. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, that's, that's a monk. <laughs> Absolutely true story, no exaggeration, he did that. And so, you know, when I went to see him, he's a good friend, and he was telling me, he said, I was telling all these people over in Perth, they said I shouldn't be travelling around so much, I'm just working too hard, I should sort of relax a bit more. He said, no, please tell them, please tell them, Ajahn Brahm, if you stop all of this, you stop working hard, you will die. That's what he told me. <laughs> and I said, Sad, Sad, you understand. You know, he's a powerful monk. Giving and serving gives you meaning in life. If you don't give and serve, yeah, you may amass money. You may be sort of physically, you know, lots of time on your hands. But you've got no spiritual energy left in you. you know, they say man doesn't live by bread alone, neither does women, whatever it is. You live by giving, serving, giving your life meaning. That's why people get depressed. They don't give enough. I don't talk about money. I mean, giving to other people, helping one another, serving, sweeping the paths, just cleaning the toilets, visiting old people's homes, looking after people who are sick. That is why people get depressed, because they're not serving, sharing, giving. The, the spiritual power of serving and giving is not there. That's why the tree lasted for such a long time, even if it didn't have any trunk to it, just the roots. Its spiritual power was immense. Have you seen people, 90, 95 years of age, and they're still going strong, and they're just beautiful people to be around. They know how to give and share. Hear their stories of what they've done for others. They're not famous people, they just have beautiful families, they've shared, given, served, they will ask for nothing back in return. That's the spiritual power which stops you getting depressed, actually stops you getting sick too. So that is the service. So why are you giving and serving and doing things for other people? Just because that's what, it's, what it means to be a human being. That's what we're here for. Otherwise, what are you here for? What's life all about? Is it just you know, going to school, going to university, you know, going out, getting married, having kids, getting a job? waiting for the weekends to have a bit of fun and games and then go to work again. You've had all these long weekends and now you're back at work again, you're just hanging out for the next long weekend. And then you sort of, you know, your kids grow up and they leave and then you sort of, okay, maybe go caravanning around Australia. Is that really what you want to do? And then you retire and then you find out you've got to retire when you're 70 now and she's, <laughs> what am I going to do next? And then you're just going to die. Oh, is this it? Whoa, what is this life all about? I just told you what it's about. It's all about giving, that's what you're here for. Sharing. And don't just think it's just because your own kids or your own parents. You know, on Mother's Day, find another mother, not your own, and send them a card as well. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful idea? Just celebrate mothers, not necessarily your own. <laughs> Send a card to me on Mother's Day. I'm not a mother, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> now that is what giving and sharing and kindness is all about. That's what the tree story is all about. And if, if, if you heard that tree story and were moved, because you know, tell a story, and it, stories are great, they encapsulate so much about what life is all about. You know, say it in theory, say all these words, and it doesn't really get it, but say a story that's beautiful. You remember it. And that's what life is all about. When I first heard it, I thought, wow, what a great story. I can understand that. Why a tree grew in the first place. Its whole purpose in life was to give its wood, its leaves, its fruit to others. I remember this little... Uh, this little sign in a forest in Sri Lanka years ago. Trees are just so kind. They even give shade to the person cutting them down. And that's just a beautiful thing. They're hurting, they're killing the tree, but they still give shade to the people who are destroying them. That's kindness. 
That's something which is beautiful. That is something which is totally illogical, 100% emotional, and just so, so Buddhist. Even though someone is cutting you down and killing you, you still give shade to them and protect them. That is the meaning of life. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Now, how many times have I said this? If you're going to do something, do it properly, 100%. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you so much. Now, questions, comments, and complaints. Okay, oh, we're live streaming today again. Ah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Just from overseas, quickly. Toronto and Belgium. First of all, from Toronto, my mother loved me unconditionally and cared for me like the tree in your story. When you started telling the story, it just felt you were telling me about my mother. I want to continue to do something for her even when she's not with me, physically. What can I do to keep my mother's soul happy? You know, she just, uh, it was actually, I think it was your grandmother, because she wrote to me uh, from Toronto, but was basically brought up this girl. What can you keep to do to keep your mother's soul happy? You don't need to do anything. If your mother has cared for you like that in Toronto, she is one of the most happiest people you can ever know, even though she's dead. She's so happy that she's served and done something for you. So what you can do for her is you go and love somebody else and care for them. It's one of the things I was taught. If somebody gives me anything and I give you something back, finished, transaction over. I was told by my master, if, I, if my master, my teacher Ajahn Chah had helped me, don't say thank you back. If he's helped me, I'm in debt. And the only way I can pay off that debt is by helping somebody else. So, Hardish in Toronto, if your mother has looked after you so much, you go and look after somebody else. And when that person wants to thank you, say, no, 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 you're in debt, you've got to now help another person. So the gift never ends. I help you, you have to help somebody else, and tell them they have to help somebody else. Don't give it back to the person who's helped you. Give it on to somebody else. That way the kindness and the giving keeps going on and on and it never, ever stops. It's like a, one of those chain letters. I help you, you've got to help two others. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. So that's how the love and kindness goes on. So and if that tree in the story sounded like your mother, sounded like my father and my mother too who died, then that's how I can make my mum and my dad happy. They died years ago, my mother about three or four years ago. This is a way I can make them happy. By making you happy. <laughs> okay? And from Belgium. Should we, out of kindness to ourselves, put certain boundaries towards people who take advantage of us? Take your generosity for granted. What is the line between giving and being a doormat? Giving is being a doormat. <laughs> and I'm very happy to be a doormat. The door of my heart is open and every door has to have a mat. So to open up my heart to other people, you have to have the mat and they walk all over it, <laughs> like the tree does. Now that's not the answer people want. They want, oh, I have boundaries, I've got to look after myself as well. Yeah, up to a point, but sometimes to actually help others and on this talk, the kindness, Sometimes be like the tree, sometimes be willing to give your life for kindness. Have you seen people do that? It's incredible, just the power of such an act. When someone sacrifices their life, they run across the road and push the kid out of the oncoming truck and they get killed themselves. Is that a stupid thing to do? Or was that something which was really inspiring? What would you think? <laughs> it's usually that they're heroes. And there's so much negative publicity, negative stories about how people act. To see someone doing something totally selfless, not thinking about themselves. Sometimes there's something in that which gives us hope for our world. 
we're not all in it for ourselves. And sometimes we can be a doormat. I've been a doormat in Perth for the last 31 years. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so I, I'm happy to be doing that. So obviously that's, you know, if you really get very involved, you can actually don't need any boundaries at all. You can be just like that. So, look, as a parent, do you put boundaries, too many boundaries, when you've got little kids? They just climb all over you. What are the boundaries? Have you ever seen these little cats, you know, when they have kittens? And they lick up all the, the kitten poo. They eat it. It's amazing just what a mother does for her kids. Mothers have got no boundaries at all for their kids. They look after them no matter what. It's amazing. That just that inspires me when I see things like that. But if you can't do that, you know, be kind to yourself. Know your limitations. But see if you can extend your limitations. And please don't sort of put so, so limited boundaries around yourself that you can't be kind and love other people. Being kind and loving other people means you will get hurt. That's part of the, the, uh, part of the, the deal. You will get hurt, but that's part of life. And it's part of life to be celebrated. Give, give, give. Be hurt, hurt, hurt. Love, love, love. And every time it fails, never ever put your heart into a concrete bunker. You may feel safe in there. You won't get hurt, but you're dead. You won't live. So, I put boundaries, extend the boundaries. You have boundaries, you all have boundaries, but please extend those boundaries and see how far you can extend them. And eventually, have no boundaries at all. Okay, people think I'm idealistic. Well, I live by that. Any questions from the audience here? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I, assuming that you're truly compassionate, wouldn't it be wiser to give to somebody who might recognise that than to somebody who might may never recognise? Oh, okay, that? yeah. But if they recognise it, they don't really need it. You want to have people who don't recognise it. It really blows their minds. Someone has been kind to me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Those are the interesting ones. That's why it's great, you know, whenever you see like a born again Christian who's just trying their hardest to convert you. Is being really kind to them. <laughs> Look, I don't know if you know this story. A true story. It was in the newspapers in Sri Lanka. There was this great little story. There was a uh, one of the monks over there, always giving blood. You know, every sort of six months or three months, and he got a letter from the blood bank saying that there was a person who needed a kidney, and he was an organ donor as well. You know. And they said, uh, you know, would you mind? You know, you had two kidneys, you can do without one. And he said, can you give this, uh, you got your perfect match to this person who needs a kidney desperately. Would you mind donating one of your kidneys to this person? And I said, of course, you're no trouble. But he said, there's a problem. The problem was that the person who needed your kidney, you know, he was an evangelical Christian going around Sri Lanka conver converting the Buddhist to Christianity. He said, no, he's, no, he's, uh, he's taking away all your followers. And I said, what do you mean? Of course I can, he can have my kidney. It doesn't matter what religion you are. You know, if you're a, if, uh, it's just like, you know, if a Jew found out that a Hamas wanted your kidney, of course you can take my kidney. Just because, you know, you're sort of, we've got some religious differences, that doesn't mean anything. You're a human being, you need my kidney, I've got a spare one, take it. So he donated the kidney to this evangelical Christian. And it was in the front page of the newspapers simply because it was inspiring. So it doesn't matter if a person appreciates it or not. In fact, the less they appreciate it, probably the more important it is. People need to know some kindness. If you've got a neighbour who's always angry and upset and always swearing at you. Just leave them something. Send them a gift, send them some flowers, do something nice. And they'll think, you know, probably set their dogs on you, but then give the dogs some nice meat or something. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> okay. Thank you for asking that question. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, time to go. So thank you for listening and I hope that inspired you and makes you better human beings, which is the whole purpose. So let's now pay respects to Buddha Dharma Sangha. Supatipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami